And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Ross Hannan, who is the Deputy Dean of Research at our university's College of Health and Medicine, and also the Centenary Chair in Cancer Research at the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Uh, Ross uh, has a PhD from the University of Tasmania. Um, he then did postdoctoral research in the United States and returned to Australia in 2000. Uh, rose through the ranks uh, as an academic in different places in Melbourne. And uh, as I said before, he's now a centenary chair of cancer research here at our university. Um, he's known for his multidisciplinary work on ribosome biogenesis, which has led to new treatment paradigms in cancer centered on drugs that activate nucleolar stress. So with that, I hand over to you, Ross. So, uh... Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak to everybody. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much to Janelia Research Campus and Howard Hughes for uh, allowing us to talk. I'm going to talk about targeting ribosomal RNA synthesis for the treatment of cancer. And just to remind you that uh, we're doing this work in the Shine Delgado Center for RNA Innovation. Uh, and that's been a really important uh, uh, new initiative led by Thomas Price. So these are my disclosures. I uh, received funding from Pomerath Therapeutics, which is a company I helped start, and I'll talk a bit about that work today. So this is ribosome biogenesis, which I study, and ribosome biogenesis is probably one of the most complex processes the cell undergoes. Uh, it uses a considerable amount of the cellular energy and normally it can constitutes up to 60% of the total transcription in the cell. Um, growth factor signaling pathways or negative regulators of growth directly regulate RNA polymerase 1, which is the enzyme dedicated to the synthesis of this uh, large non-coding RNA, the 47S, uh, which gives rise to the 5.8S, 28S and 18S RNA. But you also require RNA polymerase 3 to generate the 5S, and RNA polymerase 2 to generate the ribosomal proteins, which are then assembled into the large and small subunits in the nucleolus, which are then exported uh, for, for translation. Uh, I've got MIC up here just to remind you that MIC is one of the most potent regulators of this pathway, and we think it sensitizes cells to these drugs shown in red, which I'm going to talk about today, which directly inhibit the transcription and synthesis of this ribosomal RNA, and we've used that to treat cancer. So just to remind you about the RDNA repeats, they're unique in the fact that you have up to 400 copies of these ranged in a head-to-tail fashion. Uh, this is just a blow-up schematic of one of those RDNA units that has a promoter like a pol 2 gene, an enhancer, and then the 18, 5.8S and 28S. And this is tr transcribed exclusively by RNA polymerase 1. These are found on the acrocentric uh, chromosomes, and they... Uh, through phase condensation, they coalesce of the different uh, five different chromosomes coalesce into these nucleoli. And that's better shown in this diagram here. The blue is just DAPI stains, this is a nucleus. The red is RNA fish to, to demonstrate the RDNA transcription. It's probably worth reminding people that the nucleoli have been uh, evolved to undergo many other processes in addition to ribosome biogenesis. And indeed, there's up to 4,000 different proteins in the nucleolus. And only 30% of them are involved in ribosome biogenesis, but I won't have time to talk about those other functions today. Um, RNA synthesis is upregulated during malignant transformation. This is a model of a MIC driven lymphoma where uh, MIC is driven by the EU <coughs> enhancer. These mice within 20 weeks get a significant uh, disease, as shown here. If you look at the, uh, pre, pre, uh, the pro pre B cells, massive accumulation of these uh, malignant cells. This correlates with a significant increase in RDNA transcription of wild type, pre malignant, malignant. This is pre RNA expression on the side there. This is a massive increase, probably 95% of all the RNA in these cells are ribosomal. And this is RNA fish going from wild type, pre malignant to malignant, and you can see significant increase in ribosomal RNA. So it's significantly upregulated in, in cancer. This is the reason why we thought it might be a good target. Um, this just shows, excuse me, if you do a pole one ship, uh, for bile type pre malignant malignant across the transcribed region, you see a significant increase in ribosomal RNA, and that's what's driving this increased transcription. So the question is then, what happens if you inhibit RNA synthesis? Do you just get less ribosomes? Well, it turns out that actually during evolution, uh, the nucleolus has evolved 
uh, mechanisms to sense fidelity of the ribosomal biogenesis pathway. And when this pathway, because it's so important, is dysregulated, it activates these checkpoints. There's many of these checkpoints, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the basic premise is that you disrupt ribosomal biogenesis, which leads to disassembly of the nucleoli. This allows ribosomal proteins that were normally incorporated into the ribosome to go about, to come out of the nucleus and have many other functions. For example, activating the expression of P21, turning off MIT through various mechanisms, turning off E2F. Probably the most predominant one is this one here, which is the regulation of the tumor suppressor P53. Two ribosomal proteins, L5 and L11, bind the ubiquitin ligase MDM2, therefore preventing it from degrading P53. You get accumulation of P53 and growth of the vision apoptosis or senescence. And that's just shown more clearly here. This is a Western block for P53. At the top here, you can see when we add actinomycin D at low doses, which inhibits pole one transcription selectively, you get a massive upregulation of P53. And if you take out L5 or L11 by knocking them down, you can actually completely block that activation, showing it's dependent on L5 or L11. We can do a similar experiment where we take a version of MDM2 knocked in, which has a mutation which prevents L5 and L11 binding. Once again, it completely blocks the activation of P53. Showing this pathway, <clears throat> accumulation of uh, this P53 is, is completely dependent on this nuclear surveillance pathway. Now, what's interesting is that, that it's not just ribosome biogenesis uh, uh, and inhibition of pol one transcription directly that causes this pathway. Here we've done a high throughput screen, and this is P53 intensity shown on the bottom. If we knock down a whole bunch of genes in the genome or ribosomal proteins, you activate P53. And if you knock down L5 or L11, you block that. So almost any gene in the genome that you knock down uh, requires a nuclear surveillance pathway, and it's not just uh, a genotoxic things. If you take various treatments, such as actinomycin D, alpha-amanitin, the topazide, a fifluorouridine, a UV treatment, um, irradiation, all of them require a, a, in, an intact nuclear surveillance pathway to stabilize P53, suggesting that this is a primordial, probably one of the most important pathways for regulating P53. So we've tried to harness this to actually test whether we could actually use this to develop drugs. And this is just mainly for the, some of the graduate students that might be listening. This is sort of the pathway we took did high throughput screens of a compound library of 100,000 compounds looking for things which inhibited POL1 transcription. We did a counter screen to make sure that they didn't inhibit a POL2 gene. We went through various uh, PK oral cassettes, secondary screens, primary development, and this is the pathway I won't go through it in detail. And this just shows you the sort of money that we had to generate to get through these different pathways. And here shown here is actually the, the sequence, the timing of this, and it's sort of important for graduate students who are developing drugs. You can see the sort of time it took. Began screening in 2008, lead drug 2010, our first paper 2011, so that was like, you know, three years later. First funding four years after we started. And probably the breakthrough paper was this biowater red L cancer cell paper, which led to funding for the clinical trial. This clinical trial has now been completed. This drug inhibits uh, the initiation of pole one transcription, and this is their tattoo of the actual CX5461 on one of my very enthusiastic students. We recommend all students get a tattoo while they're doing their PhD. And we've published many, many papers on this, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, they can be found online. This is just one example from the paper. This is the emu MIC model again, where we adoptively transfer the, the MIC driven lymphoma cells into mice, and they get diseased very rapidly within eight days. This is the tumor cells here, shown in green because the fluorescent tag. Here's the tumor cells shown here. If we treat the vehicle, it has no effect. If we give a single dose of CX5 or 6 one we completely eradicate the tumor cells, and importantly, the normal cells come back. So this shows, very surprisingly, that you can actually target a, 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 one of the most basic housekeeping processes in the cell, the synthesis of the non-coding ribosomal RNA, and get, like, get selectivity to killing tumor cells. And this was totally unexpected at the time. This leads to nucleolar disassembly, as I suggested, and a rapid activation of P53 within one hour, and apoptosis starting, this is caspase 3 cleavage within three hours. So this is a rapid response. These cells are dying rapidly. It's not a slow response to the loss of ribosomes. So we've tried to use this to see what sort of models we could treat in cancer. 
This also leads to a significant increase in survival of these uh, mice. Uh, they eventually relapse through acquired mutations which bypass this process. So this drug now has moved to phase one trial, which we've completed, um, which we've published in Cancer Discovery. It's gone on to a couple of phase two trials and now has been fast-tracked for therapeutic um, treatment of patients with breast or ovarian cancers with BRCA mutation. Now, one of the problems with this drug, as I noticed early on, is that in addition to inhibiting POL1, it caused DNA damage around the nucleus. This is CX compared to tomicide, the red is that gamma H2X is a marker of DNA damage. And it turns out this drug is actually has activity to inhibit uh, TOPA 2 alpha in addition to POL1. And it turns out that TOPA 2 alpha is part of the initiation complex. So this DNA damage was just occurring around the, nu the nucleus where the POL1 transcription takes place. And it was probably the reason for the limiting toxicity due to photosensitivity in the trial. Because of that, although this is a useful drug, uh, we set out to develop uh, second generation POL1 inhibitors, which were cleaner and with let, had no effect on DNA damage. And that drug, which we developed, is PMR116, developed by Nadine Hine and Kate Hannon in the laboratory. And it has significant advantages over the first generation inhibitor, uh, particularly it penetrates the blood brain barrier. And we want to use this for brain cancers. And a lot of this work was done at the ANU Center for Therapeutic Discovery in the John Curtin School of Medical Research. So this drug inhibits POL1 transcription. Where is it inhibited? Well, this is a chip assay showing polymerase across the RNA gene and vehicle with PMR116. We don't decrease polymerase at the promoter and the enhancer, but we do across the gene suggesting it's blocking promoter escape. It has about a, a, a thousand-fold increase in sensitivity compared for POL1 compared to POL2, so it's selective and it selectively kills tumour cells compared to normal to, to normal cells. So we think this is a good drug to take forward in our treatments. Most importantly, it doesn't induce DNA damage. This is a vehicle, whoops, sorry, this is a vehicle treatment of, let's go backwards, vehicle treatment of cells, the, sorry. Vehicle treatment of cells on the left, a PMR and then CX5461, green is DNA damage marked by gamma H2X. And you can see significant DNA damage with CX5641, but none of PMR116. Similarly shown here in the Western blocks on the bottom, both drugs activate P53, but only CX5461 activates check one and check two, which are marks of DNA damage pathway. So we're quite confident this drug doesn't activate DNA damage. It is a clean pole one inhibitor. So it treats mice with lymphoma. This is the same model I showed you before, the immunic lymphoma with a significant increase in survival. We spent quite a bit of time on other models, uh, hem hematological models, and this is a model of AML. This is an incurable disease in humans. Um, this is driven through a mixed lineage leukemia fusion proteins. These mice also bear activated RAS because about 20% of these mixed lineage leukemia um, cancers have activated RAS. We can also monitor the cells through GFB and luciferase. This is a, a, an adoptive transfer of these cells into the mice, which, which come down with leukemia. As can be shown here on the right, this is three different doses of the drug. You can see a significant increase in survival, which is better shown here on the bottom left, where survival versus days post-transplant. If you look at the standard therapies for patients, Cytarabin so doxorubicin, they only get about 20, 22 days uh, increase in survival. So this increase in survival is significant, and we have high hopes for this drug for treatment in AML. We've tried, tried this out a number of different tumor models. This is a colorectal cancer syngenaic uh, model, um, and we can show that PMR116 is superior to irinotecan, shown here in the survival, red is CX, uh, PMR116, where this is the standard drug used for patients. You know, TCAN, and you can actually follow individual tumour volume here on the left. The red is the PMR116 and blue is the RNOTCAN. And one of the other models we've spent quite a bit of time with, there's different models of uh, a pedicella cancer, and this is a DEN-induced, you know, chemically-induced model, and we see significant reduction in this massive increase in tumours in this model for the treatment of PMR116. Better shown in this graph here, we can see this robust decrease in both the numbers of tumours uh, within these livers. And so we're following this up uh, for, for various other models of liver cancer. 
Um, probably, and this is a collaboration with Luke Furick from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and some other people such as Gary Risbridger. We're lucky to get access to a warm autopsy of patients. Uh, unfortunately, patients have sort of died, but we've managed to get access to their tissue within a couple of hours of death so we can get tissue from places we wouldn't normally be able to get it from, such as bone uh, or the brain or the lung. In this case, we've got a xenograft uh, from the uh, uh, mice. This is a, a metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which is lethal in men. And we can see here that uh, 300 milligrams of PMR116 treatment, not only does it block the growth, but actually gets rid of all the tumour cells. So this is a, a fantastic response, given this poor unfortunate patient died of this disease. Not all of them respond as well. This is a, another prostate cancer that's metastasized to the dura, but even then we see a significant uh, decrease in the uh, tumor size. So we're very hopeful for this in the phase two part of the second part of the phase one trial, we're hoping to test this on uh, prostate cancer patients. So where are we up to with this drug? Well, we've got FDA investigational new drug, drug status granted. We've opened a multi-center uh, first in human uh, study with this at the Pigma Callum Cancer Centre and other places around Australia. The first part is a dose escalation phase shown on the left, and then the second part, which we're up to at the moment, will be an expansion phase where we'll be testing those patients which we think will best respond. In this case, we're confident that patients with MIC aberrations uh, will respond best because we know that MIC drives RDNA transcription. Now just finally, how else will we, might we, um, in the last couple of minutes I've got, how else might we stratify patients? So it turns out that there's uh, mutations in chromatin uh, modifiers and actually histones themselves, H3.3, ATRX and DAX. So ATRX complexes with DAX to deposit H3.3 to form this heterochromatic structure. And it's very important for the stability of repetitive DNA, such as telomeric regions and also the ribosomal Genes. Now, these mutations are found in a range of cancers. We're particularly interested in brain cancers because there's been no increased uh, treatments or improvement survival in brain cancer patients for the last 30 years. Now, it turns out that if you have these mutations in ATRX, um, or you actually, sorry, you actually end up losing half your RDNA repeats. So it's, they're really important for RDNA repeat stability. Now, this loss of the RDNA repeats shown on the right hand side leads to a significant increase in sensitivity of the drug to uh, CX uh, PMR116, suggesting that patients with these mutations may, be, may respond very well. And we're going to use this as a strategy to select patients in, in phase two trials, particularly brain cancer. So I'm just going to summarise then. I've shown you that targeting POL1 transcription is a promising approach to treat cancer. And the first and generation drugs are in phase one and phase two clinical trials in Australia and overseas. This therapy effect is mediated by checkpoint activation and also differentiation. I didn't have time to show you. And this, I just want to re-emphasize, this is not a slow response to the loss of ribosomes. It's a rapid activation of these checkpoints. And we believe this nuclear surveillance pathway has been activated as a primordial sensor for cellular stress, something like akin to the canary in the coal mine. Almost all cellular stresses that stabilize P53 require this functional nuclear surveillance pathway, and that's quite surprising to us. So with that, I'll finish. Uh, this is the people who have done the work, Kate Haddon, the Dean Hine, Rita Ferreira, Amy George, and Polita Poe from my lab, and Thajani Udama, Udamana. Um, this is also a collaboration with Professor Luke Furek from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. With that, I'll leave this last slide and I'll finish. Thank you very much.